Between 1769 and 1833, 21 missions were built in California. Their aim was to convert Native Americans to Catholicism and expand European territory. Hi, I'm Shannon Rice, the podcast producer here at C-SPAN, and this week we present a lecture from Meg Apple Gundirison on the spread of missions throughout California. More after this quick break. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Hi. Um, we are looking at the church in Colonial California today. So as usual, I have our whole roadmap for the whole week. Obviously, we won't get through it all. Um, we're going to take a step back and talk about the Costa system to start with, just to kind of get a sense of hierarchies. And this particular system was becoming more popular in visual culture at the same time that the missions and the sacred expedition are beginning in um, Alta California. And then we'll get into the sacred expedition, which we didn't quite get to last time. And then we'll get into the missions themselves. We'll do a little discussion. Um, we'll do some group work, normal things. OK. So again, I wanted to start with the Costa system. We haven't talked about racial hierarchies yet in relationship to Spanish exploration, Spanish colonialism, and the Californians. So I thought this would be a good place to kind of get it in the back of our heads. And what I want you thinking about as you kind of are hearing this and what to do with it is how this might have affected how the missions operated in Alta California how they interacted with the indigenous populations, how they thought about their role and objectives in the um, agenda. And remember, the effort of the missions, at least in the purview of the um, Spanish Empire, is to build colonialism, right? Is to spread the Spanish colony and to pacify the people who are um, occupying that space, right? So also keep like that in mind. So as colonialism is growing, we see this happening, of course, not just in Spain, but other Western empires. Europeans, including the Spanish, seeking out ways to justify their claims, to justify why they should be in the spaces they are, why they should be the ones dictating how things go forward. Also, this is in conversation with growing and developing chattel slavery that's existing in North America as well as elsewhere, and justifying who can be enslaved, who cannot be enslaved. That's kind of background stuff. What we see happen in um, the Spanish Empire is the development, the refinement of the Costa system, this should be think, thought of as something that's more of a loose directory, um, a loose kind of idea of hierarchy, not something that's set in stone and that can never be changed. Um, it can be at times very detailed and at times pretty rudimentary. But as you can see here, what it prioritizes first is Spanish and European identity. The people at the top of the hierarchy and the Costa systems, especially in um, Nueva España, New Spain, the um, present day Mexico, are people who were born in Spain on the Iberian Peninsula. They're the top of the hierarchy. So Europeans, then in that first category, then indigenous people, then people of African descent. And one of the things they really start to dislike, even though they had relied on it earlier in their colonial efforts, is the mixing of um, racial couples. So quote unquote pure individuals are prioritized and then the various interracial mixing is then categorized under each of these. So that's kind of how they're differentiating this. And they had these huge charts. And these came into popularity in the mid to late 18th century. So overlapping with the chrono chronological period we're looking at today, which is why I wanted to start with it. Um, at times, these um, paintings can get really, really detailed. This is a nice basic one. This is a typical one where we see 16 squares. But they could go up to somewhere in like the 70s with the categories of individuals and groups of people. So a lot of time and attention being placed to it. One thing we might think about is about why they're coming into popularity is how much they're trying to influence through visual hierarchy and reaffirm their rules. All right. So that's, I just want you to have that in the back of your mind. Obviously, we could spend a whole class just talking about that. But I wanted you to think about this hierarchy in the back of our um, heads as we're moving through um, the missions. OK. So last time we left off, we were talking about moving back into Alta California. we have seen various Spanish explorers coming in and out of Baja and Alta California for a variety of reasons. Now we're in the late 18th century, and we're beginning what Una Paracera would call the sacred expedition. So this goes back to 1768. Jose de Galvez, he was a leader in the colonies, um, was looking to find a way to colonize Alta California. Remember, part of the reason why they want to do this is to secure their land holdings. At this point, they've had encroachment by the English. There's concerns about the Russians. And of course, they're looking to um, expand their avenues to access the Philippines, because the Philippines is being governed from Mexico City. So they're looking for more quick um, access to that. 
You'll also remember that Galvez, we saw last week, he had been the one to expel the Jesuits. Remember the Jesuits had established the missions in Baja, California. They are now expelled. He's asked the Franciscans, under the leadership of Unipera Serra, to take over the missions. Serra will hand over the missions in Baja, California, to the Dominicans. And the Franciscan Brotherhood will take over the leadership of the missions that will be established in Alta, California. And as always, if you have any questions on all this stuff, because there's a lot of details, you can ask. So Galvez, Sarah, and this other gentleman, um, here we are in the middle, Portola, um, who's a captain, begin planning the settlement of Alta, California, and this expedition they're going to go on to determine where they will set up parts of their colony and what will be successful for them. These two secular leaderships, part of the military, more kind of in line with um, royal um, colonial government. Sarah is our outlier. Um, Sarah is an interesting figure in and of himself. I'll take a moment just to kind of give you a sense. He's not a noble. He's not on the hierarchy, on the class status. Of course, his race would benefit him. He had been born to a farmer in 1713 in a small village. He joined the Franciscan order at the age of 16 and was very zealous in his religious identity. He had academic promise. He had opportunities to stay in Spain and do well there. But instead, he decided in his 30s, he wanted to transfer from his comfortable life to the missionary college in Mexico City, which assigned him to some of the most difficult missions in the inhospitable regions of Mexico. He prized, like other Franciscans, simplicity. Um, he was fervent, and he saw physical suffering as a part of his faith. And this, I think, is also important to think about. As the leader of the missions, he sees physical suffering as a demonstration of your willingness to suffer before God in your faith. So when we think about the physical trials indigenous people go through as they're converting, that leadership may not see that as a negative, but rather as a demonstration of one's faith or what they're willing to go through for their faith. For example, he was noted um, for sleeping on a board um, bed. He scourged himself. He lacerated himself with stones. And when he did this um, expedition, most of the time, he was just in bare sandals as he walked through this treacherous um, landscape. And I know we did some of the readings from Palu, but this gives us a sense of kind of the um, pain he was willing to tolerate. This is describing Palu talking about Sarah um, after he had a wound. Palu says, but when I saw his wound and the swelling of his foot and leg, I could not hold back my tears, for I realized how much he was yet to suffer on those rough and painful trails that are known to extend to the frontier, and the others not yet discovered, which he must afterwards come upon. He had no doctor or surgeon other than the divine one, and no more protection for his injured foot than a sandal. For on the many journeys he took in New Spain, as well as in both of the Californias, Baja and Alta, he never made use of shoes, and what he means by that is hard shoes other than sandals, stockings or boots, feigning indifference and offering the excuse that he was better off going about his leg and foot bare. So he was willing to suffer, he was willing to keep going. His peers would have understood if he said, I need to turn around, someone else needs to go in my place. This is notable even to some of his most closest companions. It gives us a sense of the kind of willingness he's supposed to go through. The other thing to take away from this is this is really reflecting kind of a medieval sentiment towards one re religious identity. While we're moving into the Enlightenment period, and we've been in the Enlightenment period for some of the secular leaderships, he's kind of got this older mentality. And again, the physicality is part of that. All right, so back to the expedition. I just wanted you to have a sense of what Sarah is doing there. Is we have four separate parties, some of which they're going over land, led by Portola, some that are going via sea, and we also have Sarah going over land. So Portola and Sarah going over land, um, and then we have several ships going via sea up here, and they kind of will meet up in San Diego, and the plan is to continue on foot over land with two ships continuing north over sea. The plan was to rendezvous at the shores of San Diego Bay. This was the harbor, you might recall, that many had noted before, and they saw this as a good, strong harbor for Spanish colonialism, um, and then move forward. So they leave on January 9, 1769. It is a very difficult journey. One ship, the San Jose, was lost with everyone aboard. A second ship, um, the San Antonio, took 54 days to reach San Diego from Baja, California. The San Carlos took twice that amount of time with many of its crew dead and or dying upon arrival. So this was not an easy journey. It reminds us that really, despite the fact they had navigated this a few times, they really didn't understand how to navigate these seas. They really struggled. They were not well prepared. Um, they fully consolidated 
excuse me, all the groups fully consolidated on July 1st, 1769 in San Diego with only half of their original members. The San Antonio decided to return back to La Paz to regather supplies and they lost another half of their members. So a lot of people perished on this journey. On October 1st, 1769, the Portola party finally reaches the Bay of Monterey, but no one believed this was the harbor that was supposed to be so well guarded, um, so protected, so useful. How many of you have been to the Monterey Bay? And when you're looking out from the middle of the bay, like Morro Bay, does it look like a harbor or does it just look at like the ocean? Ocean, harbor, bay? It looks like just the ocean, yeah? So think about, they're coming up to us, all they see is this land, and they, I don't see any protected area. Really to understand the harbor that is the Monterey Bay, how it's protected, is you really need to be on one of the two ends, right, to get a sense of this. So they get up there, and they're completely disappointed. So now we've had a kind of poor arrival in San Diego, disappointment in Monterey, although um, Sarah will take this in a very different attitude. And finally, they move north, trying to find the Bay of San Francisco. Um, by uh, November 1st, excuse me, they were at the bottom shores of it, down where the peninsula is coming down. But they couldn't figure out the entrance. They couldn't figure out how it got out. So they were also confused and thought maybe this was a lake or something else. So there's a lot of confusion about these various waterways, where they're supposed to go. I told you they'll struggle with the San Francisco Bay. This is another one of those examples. By January 24, 1770, they had gone as far north as any Spaniard party had, led by Portola. They come back to the encampment at San Diego and end up having to wait for San Antonio to return, the San Antonio ship to return from La Paz. So basically what we take away from this, a lot of movement, a lot of difficulties, a lot of disappointment. This is supposed to be the next big frontier for the Spanish Empire, and it feels like a loss. Sarah, however, sees this as a great opportunity. He's very excited. On July 16th, 1769, just a few weeks after they arrived in um, San Diego, he dedicates the first of the nine missions he personally would found um, in San Diego, this was a very, very modest building. It's quickly um, um, erected with a thatch roof, but would eventually give rise to the other 20 missions that would be established in Alta California. And I made a mistake and said 23 last week. I meant to say 21. I was thinking of something else, so apologies on that. All right, so this gets us into our missions. A fun little advertisement there. So again, there's 21 missions that are established through the California mission period. Um, that's from 1769 to 1823. Remember, Mexico gets its independence in 1821. We'll talk about why that shifts the missions. These are supported by four presidios. These are areas where the military is at. And then there's three specific pueblos that are uh, meant for secular communities. Although we really should think of the missions themselves as small villages that had family life, people living around them, supported by the mission, supporting the mission, troops around these missions with these kind of other outposts as larger support um, mechanisms for them. Make sense? So again, the agenda here that the missions put forward, the missionaries put forward, was the idea is that they would go into the land, they would pacify the quote unquote savage people who occupied it, who lacked any religion, remember they have religion, it's just not recognized by the missionaries, convert them to Catholicism, and remember conversion didn't just simply mean changing one's faith, but changing one's entire culture. And then once they had been successful at that, it would trans over, transition over to secular control, right? That's the plan. It is also worth noting that the missions operate this way, but really are looking to have control over this region and have no real interest at ever transitioning to secular control. But that's how they get support from the military to have military protection for their exercises. Okay. Um, these are generally placed evenly apart. They are located not based on walking distance. Many of you might have heard the story that each mission is one day's walk apart. They're on average about, yeah, 40-ish miles apart from each other. But these are treacherous, difficult trails, many of which had not been actually established. You could not typically walk between each of these in a day. That is a story that gets told later to kind of sell a tourist industry to California. Um, they're located because there were places where indigenous populations were willing to tolerate their existence. And most of them are on the coast, so they're also places where ships could dock and supplies could be moved back and forth. So that's really what's going on here, not so much about this idea of how far apart they are. Um, and they have different relationships, and some of these missions will move around. For example, the first missions that's established 
in um, Monterey has to get moved because the indigenous popula population there is not keen to their existence. So also don't think of these as permanent. We talked about Panic's article last week. That there's, you know, this, we have the sixth mission church here at um, Santa Clara University right now. There was five before that. Similar things are happening in all these missions. They're moving around, they're changing, the buildings are being destroyed due to both natural causes and resistance by the indigenous population. So we have Unipara leading this. He helped establish the first seven. We get a sense of how he's thinking about this with his um, recollection of arriving in San Diego when he said, thanks be to God, I arrived day before yesterday, the first day of the month in this Puerta de San Diego. Truly beautiful and well-deserving of its fame, fame being the harbor, that's what they knew about. The mission has not yet been founded, but as soon as they leave, I will attend to that matter and we know within two weeks they're dedicating that um, quickly built mission. There's a, one of the drawings that's later created to celebrate that event. Um, as I mentioned before, this is pretty rudimentary, log shelter, thatch roof. The local population burned down the mission the following year in 1770. So one thing we want to walk away from this, depending on what you might have learned before, is indigenous populations didn't just passively accept the fact that these missions were being built in their backyards. Sometimes they saw them as opportunities for trade, for negotiation, for alliances, but they also saw them as threats. And they were constantly in dialogue with how they wanted to react to that, sometimes through outright resistance, sometimes lesser actions. Um, so they rebuilt, the, uh, they burned down the mission in 1770. They do some kind of temporary buildings here and there throughout the decade. Um, fires bring them down. We don't know all of them being direct resistance. There's an earthquake that um, also destabilizes one. The next permanent one is established in 1780. And by 1797, the mission had the largest indigenous population in Alta California, with 1,400 neophytes, and I'll explain that in a minute, in its baptismal records. So neophytes is the language that the missionaries use to describe those recently converted living at the mission. So they're neo, they're natal in their faith. We should also see this as a derogatory term. This is infantilizing the, the um, indigenous population seeing them as children, and actually the mission records will constantly see them being talked about as such. Um, okay. An earthquake destroys this one, the one that was established in 1780. Um, it's rebuilt again. Um, that was destroyed in 1803. It's rebuilt again in 1813. And if you go to the Mission San um, Diego today, that mission that was built in 1813 is the basis of the one that still exists to this day. So now what we're going to do is we're kind of kind of tour some highlights as we move through the mission being established, and we'll start to talk about the peoples who live there as well. So now we're moving up to Monterey, with Sarah and Portola um, arriving again on June 3rd, 1770, to establish their permanent settlement. Um, Sarah recalled that they built an altar under a large oak tree, hung mission bells, and held their um, mass. This, of course, isn't what it would have looked like. <laughs> this is a nice, beautiful, artistic rendition years later to celebrate the moment. Remember, these are people who are tattered. They've gone through a hard journey. It's uncomfortable. It's difficult. But this is a later celebration of it. Um, a rendering of it, not people reenacting it. He dedicated this mission to San Carlos Mermo, the second mission in California. However, as I mentioned before, it doesn't stay. Um, the following year, they move it to a new site in the Carmel Valley, about five miles away. They claimed it was due to better soil and water, but it seems it was really two main causes. The local indigenous population really seemed unwelcome, and the presidio that was being built in Monterey was really close to the mission, and despite their claims that they want to be in conversation with each other and working together, Sarah really wanted to distance himself a little bit away from the military. A couple of reasons why. One, he doesn't want the military interfering in what he's doing. He doesn't want to feel like there's secular oversight. But two, and we'll establish this further too, the soldiers were notorious for their abuse of indigenous people, particularly the women. So this is causing more friction between the indigenous population and the missions. You don't want to, people don't want to convert to your faith if people of the same faith are sexually abusing them, right? So that's also causing more problems. So he wants to distance himself for that reason as well. Supposedly, this is the mission that Sarah loved the most as he returned here often. He also died um, here over, at over 70 years old. We then have the San Antonio mission established in the San Lucia mission, uh, mountains, excuse me, and San Gabriel outside of Los Angeles as our fourth. That's um, the Presidio, apologies, I'll move on. Um, and then we have Mission Santa Clara, the eighth mission, founded on January 12, 1777. 
named for St. Clair of Assisi, the first California mission named for a woman, and of course, the only California mission that's also part of a university campus. Um, as we know, it was ruined and rebuilt multiple times, um, floods, fires, earthquakes. It was essentially abandoned when the Jesuits come back and occupy in the 1840s and early 1850s, um, but it was constantly kind of being um, in dialogue with the local um, population through religious means. By 1803, it had an indigenous population, according to its records, of 1,271. So this is just kind of a highlight. Obviously, we want to highlight Mission Santa Clara because of where we're at. But we continue to see the missions um, be built as we go through the years. But I want to take some time to talk about what there was like. We could go through each single mission, but that would take us all week, right? So let's go through and kind of get some similarities, some experiences they had um, through this period of time. <coughs> so we know the missions didn't just introduce religion, but also culture, technology, um, industry, agriculture, and military life. Most of the original Franciscan missions who were operating came from the College of San Fernando in Mexico City, which is also where Sarah was from. They understood themselves as ordinary men dedicated to the evangelization of indigenous people in California, and they didn't terribly seem concerned if these people wanted to be evangelized to or wanted to convert. Um, they see their faith as the right faith, and so even if someone is resistant to it, they're still doing God's work. Um, as I mentioned before, they never really liked the relationship they had with the military, but they were both reliant upon each other. The missions were reliant upon the military for um, protection. There is resistance. There is reason to need that protection. And the military res is completely reliant on the missions. All of their food, all of their clothing, all of their materials come directly from the missions and are produced by the indigenous population. So they need each other. They can't exist without each other. And again, the missions are established larger where indigenous people were less likely to resist or had demonstrated more welcoming attitudes. The Franciscans themselves technically had a very limited authority. This is largely because the Spanish powers believed that the Jesuits had too much power, so they really wanted to limit that when the Franciscans take over. So all they're allowed technically to do was to perform religious um, functions. Baptism, confessions, marriages, burials, and prayer. That's technically all they were allowed to do. They were not supposed to feed, clothe, provide medical care, or help the indigenous populations in any other way. And so sometimes when they'll feel like, oh, this looks like they're being relatively cruel, they're taking that very seriously. Most of them break those rules because they recognize in order to actually convert people, they have to show them some Christian charity. Sarah constantly is arguing with the governors, the secular governors, the military governors of California, largely because of that chronic sexual abuse we saw of indigenous women by soldiers that I referenced earlier. Um, this was devastating um, in both the act itself, as well as the fact that it spread disease and venereal diseases. Um, both the Spanish and indigenous people left behind records of horrific um, violent encounters. Most of these um, indict the military, but we should recognize that a lot of um, indigenous records also suggest that the priests them too could also be um, um, the uh, perpetrators. Um, let's see. The missionaries were not necessarily intellectual, even though they came from the College of San Fernando. Most of them lived really basic, daily structured lives. Um, they didn't demonstrate um, an interest in empathy to other communities or cultures, and so this also caused some um, friction with the indigenous people. And they established simple missions. Many of you have probably been to local missions if you grew up in California that are ornate and beautiful. Um, mission um, San Juan is a very beautiful mission. Our mission is beautiful. But most of the missions that are operating in this early period are very, very rudimentary buildings that are serving a basic purpose. These types of style buildings don't come until later when they're well established have mastered the indigenous labor that they have access to, and are really serving a larger Spanish colonial population than necessarily just the indigenous population. So kind of also think about that in the back of our minds. Um, most of the early missions were just simple one-room chapels with mud-covered vertical poles, um, thatch roofs, very, very um, easy to catch on fire. Many of them did. And then, of course, over the years, they'd be more built up. Most of the missionaries themselves also lived very difficult, hard lives. 
the ideal was to have two missionaries at every mission, but more often than not, in practice, this is, what, this is not what happened. Oftentimes, there was just one missionary, one priest, and they found themselves surrounded by a population who did not speak their language, who they had nothing in common with, and we know several of them had what we would now call today nervous breakdowns. They were suffering crippling anxiety because they were so isolated from their communities. That isn't to excuse their behaviors, but to provide context. Um, enough for that. Okay. Let's go back to some of the, con uh, the tension I recognized earlier, too. So as I talked about before, Sarah's really oftentimes frustrated um, with the military and secular leadership. He's constantly arguing with the military itself. He's constantly reaching out to the leadership in Mexico City about these problems. Um, one of the things he's really concerned about is that um, sexual abuse of the indigenous women um, by soldiers and missionaries. Um, he felt that it's hypocritical to their efforts and their missions and, of course, the concern of disease. And he saw this from the most upper echelons of leadership, including the governor, Pedro Vazquez, who you actually read a section about his wife's experience. So um, this is a chance. We're going to turn to our neighbors in just a minute. This is um, on pages, do I have it open? Uh, 235 in the Lands of Promise and Despair. So this section is a um, section called The Trials of a Frontier Woman. So she's Vazquez's wife. Um, I want you to think about how this entanglement between the government and the church is compliment, complicating excuse me, her petition. And what does this reveal, apologies to the typo, about gender roles in early California? So take a few minutes, turn to your neighbors, talk about what we see happening here, what she's accusing her husband of doing, how this is echoing what I just talked about, and then we'll start to have um, a few people share what comes up in your conversations with each other, okay? Things you can't, we're talking about, I heard y'all chatting, so you have thoughts, I know, but now you want to say it out loud. Yeah, I mean, really, we just kind of see the the key issues for women living in uh, in Spanish California. I think that's kind of like the main point of this. You know, not a lot of like social mobility, and even when a crime like dictated by the church is committed against uh, you know a woman of probably relatively high social standing, she still can't get the law to do anything about it. Yeah, she's married to the most powerful man right. in California. Now, she has had a step up. She's also um, a, a, a mixed-race individual, so it's the whole complicated thing about that, too. But, yes, she would be one of the most highest-status women. And the fact that she's even calling him out for this in a public venue is pretty interesting. But, yeah, she can't even get that hold, held accountable. Just one second. Okay, sorry, let's go back in the back here, and then we'll come to the front. On that, I mean, of course, adultery was considered kind of against the Catholic Church at the time. And it was just surprising how entangled the courts and the, um, what is it, the Catholic Church was. Yes. Like, they would basically believe almost anything the Catholic Church said. It was interesting that they didn't really do much of an investigation outside of conjecture, um, and then they just followed it. And then again, when you look actually at her petition, I'm assuming someone else wrote it yeah, for yeah. her. Yeah, yeah, this is like a court record, basically. Yeah, it was funny that she was like, I will carry the cross of kind of going about and explaining all this information, which it should have been, quote, prudent in the matter, but still requests a divorce, and then the church is like, no, we don't want a divorce, you should just forgive your husband, and kind of just deal with it. It's also really interesting. Yeah, so you're seeing a couple different layers here. We're seeing that this is not a, a secular state, that they're very, very intertwined, they're very um, culpable, and even though the church oftentimes was frustrated with the secular leadership, they also recognize the importance of keeping kind of the status quo, um, keeping everything kind of without rocking the boat, right? I had a, a hand up, up up here. I don't know. Did you still have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, it's kind of interesting that it wasn't just like, oh, forgive him and oh, all these guys. It was like, you have to forgive him. I think they say, or else you're going to get further seclusion, excommunication, whipping, and shackles. Like, those are, like, pretty harsh punishments for even just going to speak out against it. Um, so it's, like, kind of shows... And I think we talked about this just a bit earlier, like how intertwined the church and the, uh, the government, like legal systems, are yeah. interconnected. And that it's so, uh, like, that the, these gender roles are just so, it's so bizarre and they're, like sexist. <laughs> and, and she took great risks to do this. Yeah. She probably knew there was a possibility of that, right? It's a good point. You had a, your hand up as well. <clears throat> yeah, I found it interesting uh, when it said, or when she said, even though prudence should have prevailed, this is my crime, and it kind of goes on, but kind of this admission that, like, 
in, in order to even like kind of appeal to, to these men when she's kind of making her case, she has to admit to wrongdoing, yeah. which I kind of think, you know, goes to kind of answer the second question about, you know, gender roles in early California. I kind of think, you know, her admission kind of just kind of cementing how, how little power she actually had. Yeah, yeah. And, and these are the pretty damning charges she's raising for this particular historical moment in this particular context. And she's willing to take the kind of consequences of it, but she is unwilling to recant, right? Anything else y'all talked about? So the, the church has to be careful on how they manage this particular case because they don't really want him here. <laughs> They're not a big fan. Sarah's not a big fan of his leadership, but he also has to be careful about how he uses this to advance his concerns and causes. And he knows that if, and I shouldn't say Sarah because Sarah's not on the ground, but the um, leadership knows that if they were to take her side and really go, see, this is what we're up against, they could lose some of the power, right? We, the Jesuits have been expelled. There's always a possibility you could lose that chance. So instead, they navigate this very careful line. But behind the scenes, this allows for the expulsion. That's probably a, too strong of a word. The replacement of Fages um, in California. So he will be removed. He will get someone else there. Um, and Sarah will have someone else take his place. Um, Bucarelli, uh, Bucarelli, excuse me. Um, who will come and take his place. Um, who will also um, kind of recognize the importance of what Sarah's doing. Um, and he will also recognize that they need to have more families coming in. So one last thing to know, we're going to come back to this later, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. It's under his leadership that we're going to see a call for an overland expedition of families coming to California to bring a stabilizing force. The idea being that if soldiers have their wives and children and their families with them, they'll be less likely to harm the indigenous populations. Now, this isn't a solution to the case we just saw. Clearly, his wife was with him, and he did this anyway. But this is more of the thinking of kind of your on-the-ground troops hoping this will solve some of the problems. We will come back to this um, on Wednesday, but I wanted to acknowledge it um, here just so you know that that's happening as well. Because I want to continue on what's going on in the missions themselves. So the missions are established, and then they start to grow. We'll talk about the indigenous population, but we're going to start with the um, missions and what they're doing. Buildings began to be replaced by more permanent ones. Artisans start to come into the, from the um, secular colonies, help managing construction and training these converted indigenous populations. As more people convert, whether willingly or not, more labor is now available. They provide the labor for the missions. The missions can then grow. And we start to see the populations really expand. Um, for example, we saw the high population in Mission San Diego. We saw about 1,200 here at Mission Santa Clara. and Mission San Carlos, we have about 900. So pretty significant numbers, especially when we think about that a lot of the populations who lived here before Spanish contact were living in villages sizes about 250 to 500, right? So this is much larger than the communities they previously lived in. And these are meant to be self-sufficient areas. Some of the most grand and complete missions had living quarters for the ministers, of course, also for the indigenous, warehouses for storing goods, granaries. They had rooms to make soap, rooms to weave, carpenter shops, forges, wine presses, cellars, large patios and corrals for um, social events, workrooms for other labor that maybe wasn't specific to the ones I mentioned before, and of course the church itself. These are grand, beautiful buildings that gave the missions, the missionaries and the Spanish colonists great pride. But of course in reality it masked a lot of difficulties and pain. The missionaries saw themselves, as I mentioned before, to save souls, and they were willing to do so violently if necessary. Because again, they believe this is the only path to both Spanish colonialism and to making sure people don't spend their eternity in hell. And so they're willing to do whatever painful thing might happen here on Earth's side, in theory, um, for the betterment on, um, um, in the afterlife. Of course, we know the indigenous populations there had their own religions, their own rituals, their own cultures, their own societies, and they were forced to often deny these, give them up, or find ways to practice them um, in less obvious um, opportunities. The language we see already demonstrated the Franciscans saw them as children and often treated them as such. They beat indigenous peoples when they quote unquote misbehaved or ran away, which was simply just to go back home. Um, leaving was not accepted. The idea of like a fugitive slaves that you might think about like with American society, similar patterns are being established with the missions. Um, 
as they, uh, let's see where am I at here, um, as they transitioned and were enculturated into Spanish lifestyle with farmers, artisans, vaqueros, and choral singers, many often were still exposed to death. I'll talk about this in more detail later, but far more people um, died than were born in the missions. These numbers are extraordinary. The Spanish immigrants brought diseases with them, influenza, smallpox, and typhoid that raced through the local villages. Um, syphilis um, was common and seen often and caused um, irreparable harm. So sometimes people will ask, well, why do they even go to the missions? Why would they even accept the missions? Part of what's happening is these diseases are going past the missions because they're still in contact with each other. And villages further and further out are being decimated by disease and other things that I'll get back to. And they find themselves desperate for food, for supplies. And so they go to the missions looking for a way to survive, not necessarily aware that the reason they're suffering so much is because the mission had been established somewhere in their region. We know that the population of indigenous peoples due to the missions on the coastal parts of Alta California dropped by at least half, if not more. And again, this is assuming that the population was around 300,000 on the eve of the European contact. That's the conservative side. It could have been as high as a million. The missions themselves were populated by diverse communities. It was not one community, one village that populated the missions. It was often many that had, might have different relationships with each other. Um, the missionary leadership also regularly moved people around. They knew that if too many people spoke the same language, had the same cultural background, had the same communities, that could be the threat for the stability, right? Because they could come together to resist. So when they got kind of wind of communities creating um, spaces, speaking to each other, possible threats of resistance, they would move people to far away missions. This isn't like they would move them from Mission Santa Cruz to Mission Santa Clara, although that did happen. They would move them from Mission Santa Cruz to Mission Dolores in San Francisco. That's a much farther destiny, uh, destination. Excuse me. They also tried to get leadership from various communities to come in, hoping that that would also have people come um, into the communities. The missions themselves also vary greatly and were diverse from each other. Some were expansive estates with ranchos, farms, and industrial centers. Others had vast grazing lands and ranches for their cattle. Some focused more on agriculture. Mission Santa Barbara, for example, tended to grapes. Mission, uh, Rancho San Marcos cultivated wheat. So they also prioritized different aspects. And they, tried, they kind of demonstrated what they were doing in pride. So one thing we'd see, I'm going to go back to a uh, previous slide just for a second, is like these types of images, this is later, but still gives us a sense. They would have these types of images created and spread out around the colonies to kind of show, look how well we've done, look what we've established. And they would also share images like this one of indigenous people in Spanish dress. Um, so this is also from the reader that I've assigned to you all, but I didn't assign this particular document. Um, so looking at this, and you guys can turn to your neighbors for a second and talk about it. What kind of impression do you get the artist is trying to make about indigenous people and their experience in the missions? And how does this seem to contrast from the actual experiences they were having? So again, take a minute, turn to your neighbors, chat about that question, and then um, I'll hear from a few of you what you're thinking. Anyone want to share some of the things that came up in your groups? Yeah, here. One second, I'll come up here. Um, you're good. Okay, um, we're going to sit here and talk about how, like, they look... I think I think the word we're going to use is a well-fed, meaning well -fed. they seem oh. like a little, a little bigger. <laughs> like just, but like I think I think it kind of is like okay, like they're being treated well, like they're kind of getting the food that they need. Yeah, and this is you know what we're seeing here is it's very stylized and a very like way Europeans are being presented. So this is very similar to how they might have drawn Europeans. This is a pretty common tactic, especially with earlier art, is they just use the same faces they might have put on a European person and just supplant it onto an indigenous person um, and kind of talk about that. But I do think there's something, these are people who look like they're comfortable in life, right? That they're being well taken care of. Yeah, excellent observation. We also discussed how like the way they're dressed like shows how they're like kind of like assimilating to their ways and like of living and like Catholicism in a way and just like being a Spaniard because yeah. in like previous readings how they like said to people at home like, Oh, they're gonna take in our values. They're gonna take in everything. Yeah. But in reality, like, they they aren't. Like, it's not actually happening. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, so if you were, you know, one of the leadership, member of the leadership or um, royal um, government, and this is the images you're getting reported back, you're like, oh, this is being successful. We're moving in the right direction. Which, by the way, would mean when there is resistance that's documented, that might come to a massive shock to you if this is what you think is happening on the ground, right? Anything else? <laughs> 
So I think you're picking up, and I heard some similar things echoed around here, is on the right things, that this is really continuing to um, further the argument, the claims they're making about how colonialism is going. This is echoing the same sentiments we saw with some of the secular documents and religious documents from earlier periods of colonialism um, in um, the North American period, North American area, excuse me. And they're really kind of projecting an image that doesn't seem to be replicated um, in reality. And you can even think about some of the images I showed you last week of indigenous populations that were in the early 19th century. They look nothing like these individuals. Or even the ones I'm showing you with um, these, these are from a lot of a um, um, little bit later, but clearly they're being remembered and thought about as looking different from the Spanish, right? So in reality, there's no evidence to suggest that people were living lives like this. Okay. Indigenous people tried really hard, um, from the evidence we have, to try to keep some of their life, some of their culture, um, in their day-to-day -day life, even though they really weren't supposed to. Um, they had difficulties in doing this um, because their lives were so regimented. Um, they had times that they were supposed to get up and um, go to mass, eat breakfast, work, go to mass, um, work, eat lunch, go to mass. <laughs> you can see where their day is going. That it was meant to be filling up their days so they had little time. And yet we see evidence both in the mission documents and indigenous documents that we, efforts were taken to, again, maintain their cult, um, culture. We see evidence that they continued to cook over sim simple fire rings and familiar brush dwellings. Um, they continued to use their old tools. They continued to harvest their local foods. And they tried to keep their social and political networks and hierarchies intact. When possible, they had um, um, pared down ceremonies that they used to practice before, hunting rituals, body paintings, and paying homage to their gods of nature. They continued to use some of their prayer poles, read omens, and fast at different times of the year. And this had different levels of success. In places where um, indigenous life was greatly disrupted by the existence of Spanish, they were less successful, where they'd really been decimated by disease or violence or um, livestock they brought with them. And that could have a really devastating effect and could be harder. In places like um, San Diego County, the populations there were more robust and tended to retain their culture or have a more of a dialogue about this. And even the missionaries themselves would acknowledge this was happening but try to kind of water it down, like, oh, this is just a dance they like to do. It has no religious component. It's not a threat to our Catholicism. It seems the reason they were willing to do this is these more robust communities were more likely to resist or had resisted. So they're trying to find a space of how far can we control, where can we let them have a little sense of identity so we can maintain and lack opportunities for resistance. Um, let's see. Uh, Mission San Luis Rey, we see examples of this. A Padre there, that's Mission San Luis Rey in present-day Oceanside, um, talked about watching these ceremonies in one of his um, letters. He wrote, quote, We have made careful inquiries as to the purpose of these ceremonies, but we've never been able to obtain any information other than they did this because their ancestors practiced it, unquote. So you can see he's kind of saying it's not a big threat. They've always done it. It doesn't seem to be contrasting our Catholicism. The other thing to recognize is it doesn't seem that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that when indigenous people converted, they understood what that really meant. Um, oftentimes, their names are signed with an X. We don't see a lot of evidence to suggest that they are being taught Latin, which is what the Bible is would have been written in. Um, they don't seem to demonstrate um, in the um, documents that there was any explanation of the Catholic rituals or symbols. They knew they were required to attend church service, um, but they didn't understand a lot of what was being said there. It seems they were doing it for survival. Sure, sure, I'll do this X or I'll take this baptism if it means I can have access to your food or I have access to these tools. This does eventually change. By 1815, all the missions were presenting catechism in local dialects and trying to make this more clear. This is partially, arguably, in response to some of the records and people who are visiting and acknowledging this and saying this doesn't seem to be working correctly and the fact that they had a lot, a high number of runaways. Now, sometimes they can be successful in really kind of getting people on board, and especially in allowing some elements of indigenous life to persist. And so we have one more discussion we'll have today. Um, this is from the uh, writings by Pablo Toc. Pablo Toc um, travels to Europe in the 1830s. He was born at Mission San Luis Rey. He's a very young man. He dies when he's like 16 years old, if I recall correctly. But he was seen as kind of the promise of what the missions could have wrought. Um, he had converted to Catholicism. He was going to Rome to study um, and to become a leader. 
Um, he dies um, because of his exposure to European diseases in Europe, but he recalls some of the experiences he had um, in the missions. Um, so I have kind of two questions that go together, and then I have a quote we can think about. So thinking about how he's describing, I'd like you to, again, one last time, turn to your neighbors. Think about how Pablo Talk is describing his life in Mission San Luis Rey and how he sees Luisenos, the people he was from, retaining their culture, if you see that. And then I have this quote that he writes, um, it was a great mercy that the Indians did not kill the Spanish when they arrived. Um, so thinking about that quote, um, the resistance, even though he's someone who's loyal um, to the missionaries, what might that um, reveal to us as well? So let's just take a few minutes to talk about some of the things here or anything else you kind of note, um, and then we'll chat about this one last time. So let's start with the first question. What are some things that he's describing about how they live their life? I know there's a lot here. So what are anything that stood out to anyone, something you noticed? Um, they didn't seem to have a lot of control over their lives. Like they, he mentioned that they, they helped build a garden, but they couldn't even like really work in the garden. They could just ask for things from it. Yeah. So they provide, that's a really important point. So we see, and this is really common, is they provided a ton of labor, but they didn't actually reap the benefits of that, right? They didn't actually get to enjoy it. So if one of the reasons why they might have gone is to access supplies and food, it doesn't seem like they're actually getting that in return. And this is someone who's born in, and this is someone they consider the most favorable, like, pers- um, they're going to give us, right? There's an indigenous person who's going to have a favorable record. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, they probably weren't that used to seeing like large plantations of whatever agriculture, yeah. orchards. They kind of describe all this stuff that the what pomegranates and mm-hmm. other stuff that the Spanish were. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, melons, vegetables, cabbages, lettuces, radishes, mints, parsley, and others. Which I don't remember. You see, he doesn't remember all that. Um, <laughs> right, these big organized. Right. And one thing I thought was interesting was the melons were reserved just for the natives, which is like maybe because they're easier to grow mm-hmm. or something like that. Might have decided that they were indigenous food or something that the, we don't, that, that we don't yeah. have a lot of sense of like what the, behind that is going on. Or that's yeah. his memory, too. That's another thing we have to think about is he's writing this in Rome, reflecting back on his childhood in the mission, too. Right. In, in terms of like an incentive, though, to come to the missions, yeah. that's got to be a pretty big yeah. driving factor. Absolutely, yeah. Anyone else? Did anyone get a sense of how or ways that you see Pablo talk describing their indigenous lifestyles or rituals or behaviors being preserved? Yeah, up here in the front. Ish. <laughs> he talks a lot about the dances, and the dances yeah. are like a major part of the writing, as well as the ball game that mm-hmm. they still play. So there's definitely still some practicing of those types of traditions. In the dance section, he also mentions like clothing that was still very yeah. traditional. So yeah, he ta- I think that's such an important point. We think of it like, oh, they're forcing all this stuff. But here he is talking about, what is it, like four dances, three dances he talks about, the ball game. You're right, he talks about the clothing of feathers of various colors. The body is painted, the chest is bare. This feels a lot like a traditional like, um, part of this community's culture. It feels very much in opposition from the kind of behavior we would have expected the missionaries to tolerate, right? So this feels like there are things being preserved and there is some give and take um, happening here. And I find it particularly interesting, right, because this follows the section where he goes through, someone else was mentioning how busy their days are. So he's just going out, like, you know, the mornings we do this, you know, he's at sunrise, we have breakfast, we eat tortillas, we don't have bread, um, we go out and get extra food if we can, we go to mass, we work, and then he talks about all these dances. So there is, at least in this particular instance, some evidence to suggest that where they can preserve some of their cultural ways, their um, um, traditional cultural ways, they will. And again, we can think about that quote I gave earlier, that the missionaries themselves were like, well, it doesn't seem like it's doing anything. I can't get a real sense of it having a threat, which I think, and I interpret to go, that you know, not Pablo Talk himself, but his parents, recognize that if they're transparent in what it is, that can ha- cause them a disservice. But if they kind of play it down, like, oh, this is what we do when people get married, we dance for happiness, yes? Right? Then they'll, they'll pr- let that happen and let it continue. So you can kind of see them navigating that space. And then the last kind of point I, wanted, I asked you to think about, but we can get more into resistance a little bit later too, um, next time probably, is he talks about you know, this great mercy that they didn't kill them. And so there is a hint that there is disruption, there is frustration, there is anger. I think these stories of the missions often get told um, in one of two ways, and I think I mentioned this last week, that the missions came, um, they were established, 
and they have this beautiful legacy, and we can look at them. And again, if you grew up in California, you built a mission, and, and it was all you know, happy times, right? Or the missions existed, and they were horrific, and victimized, and terrorized the indigenous population. And both of these narratives, it silences the indigenous voices, right? We don't see people who are pushing back or resisting or navigating that space to survive. And I think that's what gets left out, is these aren't just pawns sitting around. They're in dialogue and conversation with happening around them as well, right? And so that's something we want to keep in mind. So we talked a little bit already, and we have acknowledged this. So I won't go into great detail. Um, we just have about seven minutes left about their schedules and how busy it was. Um, but I'd rather kind of talk about some of the difficulties they encountered more to get in into the idea um, of this resistance that they really kind of pushed back and thought about. So we know, let's see. We know indigenous people um, had really dangerous lives. We know they were experiencing difficulty. Um, we know there was um, limits that they were willing to tolerate and not tolerate. One of the things, there's two or three things we know became kind of catalysts for some kind of action. Women being sexually assaulted, we see reaction to that. Violence and punishment, lashings, public lashings. This was seen in almost every indigenous culture in California as inhumane. They would never do that to someone else. The idea of bringing someone before your community and whipping them in public was seen as incredibly dehumanizing. And it was very, very frustrating. Or putting them in the stocks. And again, this public punishment really seemed to be something that the indigenous populations could not wrap their head around. So while they're going through all this stuff and all these difficulties um, the, of these punishments and these encounters, at the same time, they're losing massive numbers of people. I'm, I'm kind of giving the context here. The next three slides, these are things you can look at in more detail in your own time. But I have all the numbers here, so I really wanted to highlight how difficult this is and how many people are really dying. So we have this, this is for Mission Santa Cruz. Um, these are the years, every year here, we have the baptism, people who are coming and being and baptized, whether um, of their own accord or being forced to, children being born in the natal baptisms. But then we have these burials, and I've highlighted these really stark differences. So for example, in 1796, 14 people are born, but 91 people die. 97 people came that year. 91 died. Um, if we go look at another example, let me go into another slide. I have three slides of these, just I wanted to highlight some of these really stark ones. In 1806, 90 baptisms, 15 people born, 105 people die. More people are dying than are coming into the missions. More people are dying than are being born. This is a recipe to decimate a community, to decimate a people, right? So when you take these numbers, and there's just one more, just to kind of give you a sense, these really stark numbers and then put them into conversation with these public punishments and then these violent sexual assaults, this is where we see resistance happen. All these com coming together is when we start to see resistance. And this is not one place or one time, but throughout the missions. So we can start as early as San Diego. Um, one of the first documented ones that was seen as a clear revolt um, was in 1775. This is after the burning of the mission. So this was seen as a period of, that was supposed to be more stable, that they've kind of calmed things down, that they've built a relationship. Um, they killed the uh, missionary, the Franciscan there. This is a quote from the other missionary who was um, um, there, who found him. He talks about what he saw um, of his peer. I saw that he was quite unrecognizable. He was disfigured from head to foot. And I could see that his death had been cruel beyond description and to the fullest satisfaction of the barbarians. So you can see here, like he's reedifying their inhumaneness himself, right? And I'm sorry when I, that formatted weird. Um, he was stripped completely of all his clothing, even to his undergarments around his middle. His chest and body were riddled with countless jabs they had given him. His face was of one great bruise from the clubbing and stoning it had suffered. When you see that level of violence, that is anger. That is personal. That is retribution for the violence they feel they've suffered as a people. The entire mission was attacked, but they particularly singled out this missionary, we think because he was so cruel in his punishment towards indigenous people. So when we see these actions, it happens time and time again. I'm going to skip over these set of questions so we can give us another example. And Mission Santa Cruz, and this is something we'll talk more about next time. Um, Mission Santa Cruz is another place we know a lot about um, violence that happened in 1812. Um, we know that in Mission Santa Cruz, there was a, a missionary there. He's also killed, but he's killed in a way that's more discreet. They don't realize it's an assassination until later. At first, they think he died in his sleep. But he was known for being so violent to the indigenous population. He whipped them with iron tips in public um, in front of all of their peers. This is following another attack um, a couple years earlier in Mission San Luis Rey, where Pablo Talk was, 
um, where they had shot flaming arrows that set the thatched roof on fire. In 1781, the Yuma people had attacked a party of soldiers traveling through California for fear of what they might establish or bringing a mission um, to um, their area. So time and time and time again, we see these attacks. Now I'm leaving this up here because we only have two minutes and we don't have a chance to discuss it. But what I asked you to read for this week was two different documents. One is a descendant um, of one of the people who participated in the rebellion at Mission Santa Cruz, and he's remembering and um, um, uh, making note of what happened. His first name is Lorenzo. The other is a source by Martin Rizzo, where he talks about the women who helped plan this. And so that's what I'd like us to start class with on Monday, is having this conversation about how we understand these um, um, rebellions, who's participating in them, how we get at that evidence, how we're breaking down history. That theme, how we know what we know. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. If you have any questions about anything going on, come see me. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for listening to Lectures in History. We want to make sure you know about our latest podcast, Books That Shaped America. It's a companion podcast to our 10-week television series of the same name. We've teamed up with the Library of Congress and selected 10 books from across American history that have had a major impact on our society. Each week, the C-SPAN television program will focus on one of these books and its impact. This companion podcast will give you more background on the book's authors. If you want to learn more about books that shaped America, go to our website, c-span.org. The podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts.